Thank you so much for having me. While I wish we could have been together in person, physically today to hang out and talk about all the great things everyone's been doing, I'm glad at least that we can come together virtually and have some of that same time together. I'm honored to speak to you today, and I'm going to try and touch on a wide variety of topics. As such, I may only go an inch deep on a wide range of ideas, but I'm especially interested in your feedback and questions. The most important thing to take away from this talk is to critically think about how we look at the software we're making and all the various dependencies it has. So you should start that critical thinking by thinking critically about my presentation. I'd love your feedback, questions, challenges, ideas to come as I'm presenting or after the talk. First today, I wanna to talk about a story. A story that is not new to our modern world, a story that's been a critical part underlying human society for, well, for as long as humans had a society to speak of. In our modern age, we might call that a supply chain or logistics or infrastructure. Whatever you call it, as long as humans have organized themselves and created specializations, and as long as we've had adversarial relationships with other humans, there would have been what we would call today supply chain attacks. Many wars were fought and won on the basis solely of the ability of one side or the other to control or master their supply chain or that of their adversaries. In The Art of War, Sun Tzu writes, the line between disorder and order lies in logistics. And in the technological age, the age where software has eaten the world, software is just reliant on supply chains as any other part of our critical infrastructure. And software can be eaten by its own supply chain. And that's what happened in the recent SolarWinds hack. In fact, that hack itself wasn't just a single event. It was a sophisticated, coordinated, focused attack that took months to execute. And it wasn't conducted against the main targets. SolarWinds, in this case, was part of a supply chain for the real targets. High-profile Fortune 500 companies and U.S. government agencies. And while we don't know everything about how this attack happened and exactly who was responsible, we do know that the attackers intentionally sought the weakest links in the supply chains of their targets. Instead of attacking head-on or through some sort of other inflammatory attack aimed directly at their adversary, the attackers chose to hide in plain sight, blend in with the other software deployed, and then slowly exploit that point of entry for their real goals. This attack method, just as any supply chain attack throughout history, is not a new one. In fact, another one of the victims and the team to first announce the discovery of the hack and report it publicly was FireEye. Before that, they had released a report to NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, as part of the United States Resiliency Project. And they warned of just this set of circumstances. In cybersecurity, it's often not enough to have your own house in order. As targets or organizations improve their own security posture, attackers will compromise much less mature companies who can then be used as entry points to their real enterprise targets. And that's precisely what the SolarWinds Sunburst attack represents. Attackers could access SolarWinds build system where they created their various packages that they then distributed to their customers. Those customers relied on that software that they produced, installed that software with expansive permissions across their fleets, and accepted updates directly from SolarWinds. But for months, those updates were controlled by the attackers, giving them administrative access to machines across various government agencies and untold enterprises. As we've said, the attack was not a full-scale assault. It was calculated and slowly exploited. Given the manual way that CICD was configured for SolarWinds, it was relatively easy for the attackers to influence the build process once they had accessed the build infrastructure. Builds were done on a set of machines and signed with SolarWinds electronic signatures. Since the attackers had taken control of these VMs, they were able to inject any malicious code that they wanted directly into the build pipeline. And at first, they just tested this capability to see if it would be detected. A few months later, they decided to release the real payload, Sunburst, which took the Orion software and Trojanized it, allowing the attacker to monitor 
and attach to any system that had the infected Orion update. From there, the attackers would deploy a third type of malware called Teardrop that was installed via that back door that Sunburst had opened for them. Of course, this practice of using dedicated VMs for the build and certification process is not unique to SolarWinds. And as the CEO of SolarWinds aptly pointed out, they're not the only vulnerable party here. Many other enterprises and software companies use similar build processes and would be susceptible to similar attacks against their CI CD infrastructure. But in some ways though, that's exactly what I wanna talk about today. Because there are a lot of dependencies that exist in our code. And sure, most of us that are here, when we hear the word dependency, think of traditional open source dependencies. A library that I bring into my code to help me do a known set of things. It might help me access a specific type of database, interact with a known API, or control a particular device. Libraries may allow me to use the language that I'm programming in for a more specific purpose. And the use of open source libraries is universal across engineering, as I've seen through my career. My name is Brennan O'Leary, and I'm talking to you today from the east coast of the United States, just a few miles outside of Washington, DC. Again, I'm glad we can be together remotely. It's something that I maybe am a little more familiar with than most. I've been at GitLab since 2017, and GitLab has always been a completely all remote company. With over 1,300 team members in 65 different countries and regions, and exactly zero offices. I'm currently working as a developer evangelist for GitLab, but I've had a lot of other roles over my time here. I spent time building up a professional services group to help our customers implement GitLab and DevOps best practices. And then for a time, I helped run our CI product, GitLab CI CD, as a product manager. And before GitLab, I spent a decade in healthcare software development, and then some time as a contractor to the US Department of Defense. In all those years of software experience, in very different environments, one thing has remained constant. The ever-growing list of dependencies that the software I was helping to build had in order to function correctly. But what exactly is a dependency? What do I mean when I say that? Well, I wanna be very specific here because dependency is easily the most used word in this whole talk. One of the most obvious things that it can mean, and it's part of what I define a dependency as certainly, is an open source dependency. Those are the libraries we were just talking about that in theory help us move faster to the end goal of solving a problem with the software we are writing. Not telling you anything you don't know here when I say that kind of dependency is everywhere. Data from GitHub's state of the Octaverse report shows just how rampant open source dependencies are. And that's just direct dependencies that are caught out in a package manager that a developer made a conscious decision to include in the project. But then there's often a web of dependencies that come with that dependency. Much like Inception, open source libraries bring along dependencies of their own. Here we can see those transitive dependencies mapped by programming language again, compared with the direct dependencies on average for each project. As someone who programs in Node from time to time, I can attest about the line above JavaScript. You can just come take a look at any of my Node modules folders sometimes. There's a lot of dependencies of dependencies of dependencies listed in there. Okay, so that makes sense. There's a code rewrite, and there's the open source libraries that we include in that code. Not much new there. We've seen this pattern before. But it's not just those libraries, it's also any other third-party libraries we bring in. And maybe those are closed source, the ones we use to access the operating system, or ones from another vendor if we're using their API. That library would then be a dependency as well. And then of course, both of those pieces have dependencies of their own. Other open or closed source libraries that are packaged into the software that we're actually using. That's how LeftPad being removed from the NPM repository all of a sudden impacts basically everyone trying to build a node app. They didn't add leftpad necessarily to their package.json so that they could pad some strings in their own application. But instead, the libraries they were using for something like Ajax HTTP requests or logging information, those used leftpad, and thus the supply chain fell apart. 
but that's just the code. That's a part of the code that we then ship. What about how we ship it? Well, the DevOps processes and how we handle those are also part of what we depend on to get code into production. Are the systems we build on the same ones that have rights to manipulate the production environment? What if those systems were compromised? Would it be better to separate out the build and test functionality from the deployment methodology or packaging of our code for our customers? And then there's the production environment itself. Where are we deploying the binaries that get created? How are customers then accessing them? Who or what do we depend on to keep those systems running? Well, <laughs> that's a lot more third parties. Vendors for our CI CD stack, for our production environment, and those vendors use other libraries, some of it open source, but probably most of it is closed source. We might bring in third or fourth party plugins or actions that are written to work with our CI CD infrastructure, but are written by some other unknown person or group. Again, all of these things purport to help us build code faster, ship to production sooner, and make our customers happy. But if we're not sure we can do it securely, are we sure we're not going to be the next group to fall victim to the kinds of attacks we've talked about? What really are our dependencies? Well, that's why I want to introduce or refresh and define the concept of a software supply chain. The sum total of all these dependencies is better defined as a supply chain. It makes it clear we're not only talking about dependencies in the strict software sense of the word, we're talking about something a bit more complex. But even that doesn't help. So it's more complex, Brendan. <laughs> well, then what is it? You know, I might understand what a supply chain is when it comes to manufacturing. You have a supplier of raw materials and then you turn that into a finished product. But when it comes to software, how do you define a single supply chain? It's a great question. <laughs> And so for the purpose of our discussion today, I would like to propose that a software supply chain is the sum total of anything involved in getting your code into a production environment. Any more restrictive definition, and we leave ourselves open to the ability to, either willingly or unwillingly, overlook important or critical aspects of software production and our software factory. And we've already seen how items outside of our typical dependency chain can have real world impacts on the security and operation of the software we produce. So that includes, of course, our code, but how is it created? How secure are the endpoints that our developers use? It also, of course, of course includes all of the open source dependencies our code has, and we've gone through that in detail, but what about other code that comes from sources we're not thinking about? Packages in the operating system we rely on, or from a hardware vendor, or firmware on any hardware that we're using. Those can all be aspects of the supply chain. And then as we've talked about, often our DevOps and CI CD processes are neglected. Where is the code built? Is that a clean environment every time, or is it reused? Where do we store the artifacts of the build? Is that in yet another system? And if so, what are the security permissions on each system that the code must pass through in order to get to production? Outside of that, we're bringing in you know, snippets of code or to our CICD processes. What, what other things are we depending on that we don't have any control over? And then, you know, in many environments, production systems that run the company uh, applications are highly protected and, and rightly slow. If an attacker were to get direct access to an application or database server, that would be extremely undesirable. But once you've embraced the concept of a supply chain, then what really constitutes a production system? What else should be guarded against as much as we guard the systems that our production application runs on? Well, anyone and any system that has access to production can, by virtue of that, impact production. If we're, for instance, storing the root certificate that we use to sign our software on the same pet build server that we build on, which is exposed to the world, well, that server is just as much a production system as our credit card processing database might be. 
And then really, are our developers and their systems a part of production? Well, that definitely depends. It depends on the safeguards that you have in place against either an intentional insider threat or a seemingly innocent security chain change. How you get your code from the developer's laptop to the systems that have access to your production systems, well, that is all a part of production, as is the rest of the supply chain. The security along the entire process impacts our security of the application as a whole. So let's say you're on board, your eyes have been wide opened uh, to how wide the software supply chain really is. You can see the links that are weaker than others most of the time, and you can even have a few links in your company's supply chain that you know are weak already. Now what? How can we identify and mitigate all of these risks? Well, the first step is to identify all of them. In the same sense of what is measured can be improved, you have to first know what your supply chain is before you can hope to protect it. Because if you leave something out at this phase and it's a weak link, then all of the work you do for the other links in the chain will be wasted. Once you have a decent understanding, you need to set up proactive management of those dependencies moving forward. This can't be an activity that happens once, tightens up your boundaries and security, and then slowly degrades over time to the same state you're in now. You want to automate as much as possible. Understanding quickly where any known issues that arise may impact your particular supply chain is one of the most critical aspects of supply chain security. In GitLab's DevSecOps survey for 2021, we found very inf interesting information about how teams have matured in application security over the past few years. Even as over 70% of security professionals report that their teams have shifted left, i.e. move security earlier in their deployment processes, or excuse me, in their development processes. If you dig in deeper, though, some curious dichotomies surface. So scanning has certainly increased. We shall have jumps of double digit percentage points year over year in teams scanning different parts of their code. Today, 53% of developers run static code analysis scans. 44% run DAST or dynamic code analysis scans. And well over 50% of security professionals report that they scan containers, run dependency scans, and do license compliance checks. But while there are more scans run, most results aren't easily available to developers. Only 14% of respondents said that they make the dependency and container scans available to their developers. Even at the static code analysis run on the developer's own code isn't always available at the time the developers are integrating their code together, and that can leave a lot of gaps. Today, the typical vulnerability goes undetected for four years. From the time it is identified until teams have actually patched their code is then typically another two to three months. That is all time that attackers have a surface to attack your supply chain. So shortening the length of time from an issue being identified to it being resolved is one of the most productive things your team can do to secure your supply chain. But what about the four years that the vulnerability is undetected? Or you know, even in a best case scenario, there's gonna be a few weeks or a few months. Well, for that, I recommend what I'm calling supply chain defense in depth. For those who may not be familiar, defense in depth is a concept in cybersecurity and really security in general, where you layer multiple defenses so that if one method of security controls is compromised or one vulnerability is exploited, you can limit the impact or stop the attacker with other means. For many organizations, this type of security is going to be a journey and a long one. In less mature organizations, even the idea of supply chain security, much less a defense in depth strategy, may seem very far-fetched. In those organizations, sometimes just establishing security controls, ensuring that teams adhere to existing policy, and securing your perimeter, uh, 
might be the top of mind for your security staff. But as an organization matures, they have the ability to look externally. But I believe that every organization, mature or not, can take proactive steps on each of these fronts that I've drawn here. So there's two basic types of vulnerabilities, right? Those that are known or public in the industry and those that are unknown and waiting to be discovered. And then in looking at our supply chain, we can say that each link or dependency on that chain can be seen as either internal or external dependency, depending on where that code or tool is coming from. For each square in this matrix then, we should have a plan in place for how we're going to identify and mitigate those threats for each link in our chain. I've put some examples in here and really how you handle each of these could be you know, an entire talk in itself. For instance, uh, zero trust is a relatively mature pattern, but it's one that I expect to see more and more support for in coming years as folks are talking about supply chain security. But even if your team isn't there yet, they should still be able to expect that their suppliers you know, produce a bill of materials so that you can at least understand the dependencies that you're bringing in. Or you can start by auditing your internal and external systems to ensure that they're behaving as you've designed them to behave. As you think through your security posture, figure out where it lands on this grid and identify which spot in your own grid and, and f is, is weakest and figure out how to you know, reinforce and shore up that weak link. And okay, I know as, as you think about that grid, it's rather simple on the surface, but gets pretty intimidating pretty quickly. So where do you get started? What can you leave this talk today and do to make your organization less susceptible to supply chain attacks? That's a great question. <laughs> well, the first key is to understand your supply chain. If your team already doesn't have a clear diagram showing all of the various dependencies that are in your chain, start by drawing your own and then publish it. Don't worry about it being perfect. Get it to the rest of your team. Once it's written down, even if it's incomplete, it will be much easier to iterate on and make it complete. Also, make sure you understand all of the dependencies, both direct and transient, that are involved in your environment. Not only the thing you call production proper today, but all of the infrastructure involved in getting code to production. CICD, staging environments, artifact stores, and a lot more. It's been said before, but making security a key part of your development process is also critical to ensuring that you have audible, auditable, repeatable security where you can add protection as you learn of additional chains that require increased vigilance. And of course, this will be an ongoing process. So establish a plan for how your teams will continue to improve your supply chain security posture. Eventually, you'll need to ensure that as many layers of defense and depth are in place as possible. But along the way, make sure to understand all the various links in your chain so that you can always be working on the weakest link to secure your supply chain. Thank you so much for your time today. If nothing else, I hope you've thought of at least a few links in your supply chain which you hadn't considered before. While no one can ensure that all of the dependencies we use are security hole free or perfect, we can work to make sure we understand where our chain is weakest and put reinforcements and depth of defenses there to help our organization succeed. As I mentioned to you at the beginning, I'd love to hear from you. That can either be here in the Q&A portion, or you can find me afterward in Slack or around the event. Uh, after that, the best way to get in touch with me is through Twitter. Uh, I can be reached at O'Leary Crew. Um, you can also find uh, me on GitLab. I'm just gitlab.com slash Brendan. And you can find uh, my slides and other talks on my website, which is B-O-L-E-A-R-Y dot dev. Thanks and stay safe.